Hi there. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is this is our first live stream event. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Talent, we are an online community and job board for professional women to find flexible work. Um, it is our mission to help you define your own version of success and give you the tools and hopefully the jobs uh, to get you on your way. Uh, we're very excited tonight. We have uh, Kirsten Stewart here, and Kirsten is one of Canada's most high-profile uh, women in business, and she's worked at senior-level roles with Atlantis, Alliance Atlantis, CBC, and Twitter. Uh, she is now the Chief Strategy Officer at Diply Go Viral and continues to inspire inclusive and collaborative leadership through our book, Archer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Can you tell uh, those of us who aren't familiar with your story the sort of Coles Notes version of your career, how you got started as a Girl Friday with an English Lit degree uh, and ended up one of the most prominent and powerful names within the media landscape of North America? Well, that's very complimentary about setting for a big story. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell you that I think the reason why um, the feedback that I got about the book Our Turn, the reason I got feedback that women relate to it or people relate to it in general is because I was never born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I literally started as a Girl Friday in my first job. But I like to say to people, uh, like Drake says, I started from the bottom and now I'm here. And uh, I think that gives you a different perspective. Like I think, you know, getting your first job at literally a minimum wage having to do a bit of everything within an office, whether it was back in the day, faxing, uh, having to make photocopies, you know, dealing with files, dealing with communication, you know, dealing with a bit of everything in the office, gave me the exposure to a lot of everything that was happening there. And it gave me the opportunity to learn and it gave me the opportunity to learn not just the, the function of doing that job, which was in a television distribution company, which started me on the path of being in media, mm -hmm. but it, it taught me about how I am as a worker, and it taught me how my peers and the colleagues that I was working with, how they get motivated. I, got, I learned about good bosses in my career. I learned about bad, had bad bosses in my career, and I think when you have that path, you have a perspective that I think people can relate to because that tends to be what people go through in their life. They don't tend to land at that top job right out of school. And that's the challenge, right? It's how do you navigate the path? How do you go through it? And I did a sequence of jobs. Uh, I've noticed, I took a look back at my career when I made my last change, leaving Twitter and coming to Diffley. I looked back and I realized that my pattern seemed to be every three or four years, my job changed. Uh, or I changed my job and, and my outlook. And so even if I was within the same company, my job would have a major shift after three or so years. So I think for me, that is the rhythm. And it's, for me, the path was never a straight line trajectory. It was always about what I wanted to do next, where I felt my skill set matched and where I thought my values uh, fit. So the decision to leave a job and go to a job was all about figuring out yourself and your own instincts and your own internal um, mechanisms for feeling satisfied and feeling like you're contributing to something. Um, and then also understanding you know, where the business was going and keeping your head up and making sure you're aware of what was happening out there. So my, 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 my journey wasn't an easy one, um, but I was very lucky in a lot of businesses, being in the right time and the right place, but also being prepared for the opportunities and just sequential jobs, um, one after another, took me on this really interesting journey where I got to learn a lot, meet a lot of really smart people, um, and understand how to function myself as a leader within business, and so how I could be that leader that motivated others to do well and enjoy their careers fully, and that's, that's what ended up in, in the book Our Turn. And that's, it's one of the things that I felt I really connected to the book about, was that you didn't, uh, you didn't set out on a five-year sort of plan and a career path, and you sort of took opportunities and seized them as they came. Um, so as priorities shift and perspectives change, it, it can be very scary to mm -hmm. veer off that career path. Um, or it can be hard not to feel like you're taking a step back to move forward. So do you have any words of advice on staying open to, to new opportunities or forging new paths? I think you're quite right. Like I think the challenge that we have as people, particularly uh, as young women, when you're going through school and you're trying to learn about a career path, you're often told or taught, you know, have a goal, have a have a have a next career path in mind, have a plan. 
And I learned really early that first job that I got in a television distribution company wasn't supposed to be my first job. I have an English Lit degree. I had done an internship at a publishing company. That's what I was supposed to do. And so I had set out this plan of action and, and where I thought I was going to be. And I learned very early the kind of like, and God laughed, like the, sh the, the shift happened in the publishing business. There were no jobs to be had. The place that I did the internship at did not have a place for me after all. And I answered a job in a, a, an ad in a, in a local paper to start my career in media, which is, you know, it's a, it's, it can be, it can be um, challenging for people when they find themselves on a path that's so defined that the world changes. It's like I was the worst mother to my daughter who's in university right now when she asked me what should I take in school, like what's good, what is, you know, what, what is the right, what is the right uh, thing to study so that I can get a good job. And I'm like, honey, I don't know what the jobs are going to be like in four years. Like, who does? Mm -hmm. Who knew at that time, you know, four years ago, that a company named Google would have, like, be trading a thousand dollars a share and be as huge as it is. So I think sometimes when we commit ourselves to a certain path and we get very tied up and caught up in titles and wanting to make sure that we hit, you know, CEO by the time we're 30 or some such kind of goal, I think it, it, it narrows your point of view and then it narrows your opportunities because you really do need to be open. And that's why I love what you're doing because I think you get you know, the, the, the chance to step off a path, um, which doesn't happen that often and it can be a scary choice to make. The opportunity to get back on a path, you have a chance to actually try something completely different, which is what I like what you're doing and matching people to different opportunities in that, in that period where they are not necessarily where, they, where they've stepped off what their career um, path mm -hmm. is, but they've, they can forge a whole new way. So I think that's cool. How do you recognize the opportunity? So I think that for me personally, that was the scariest thing, stepping off my own career path and starting talent was knowing that, I guess you don't know, that this opportunity could be something big or I could fail. Yeah. Spectacularly, yeah. <laughs> and, and there is there is always that risk. But you did a lot of work, right? Like yeah. you did a lot of work and a lot of research to get to 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 deciding what you what, what you chose to do next. I think you know I, I re recently wrote a piece when I left uh, Twitter on Medium to describe the latest choice that I've made, which was different for me because although yes, you can look back on my career and say I've taken a lot of risky you know, moves and I've I've made a lot of interesting choices, but ultimately my career path had been to go from a job to a job because I was in the media business and you didn't give up jobs in media and know that you could land in another one that easily. It was a, that's, that's a scary field. I knew that was the area I wanted to be in. But when I was in the tech space and working with Twitter, I saw a lot of clever people around me and near me who uh, were making these decisions where they just decided they were gonna leave and see what came to them. Mm -hmm. And I think that openness was something I hadn't experienced before and something that has led me to now a position at a company that, to be quite honest, I had to Google when they called me because I didn't know who they were. Yeah. And that's, but that's good. Like that to me is a, I've now just taken a step into a position which is a CSO position. It's a C-suite position with a very vibrant company that has a, an amazing future ahead of it. And I wouldn't have done that because they probably wouldn't have used the headhunter that would have called me on the list to, 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 to have that meeting. So I think um, it can be scary and stepping off that path isn't easy. And I've had a conversation recently with someone who I think sometimes people think that um, that's, that's, because it's scary, it is scary, and it's also financially risky because you don't know that you're gonna have a business to go to or a, a next job to go to. I saved up beforehand, which yeah. I'm sure you did too. Like I think we, you make plans and you realize that this might be an interesting way to go and you don't do it impetuously, you don't do it without thought and planning and you know we're not trust fund babies and so the idea that you would make a decision like this meant a lot of talking to the family, understanding that we could be living a little bit differently for the next little while, saving the right of money, amount of money that you think you might need for the time you might be out. out. I have to do that too, and I think that's it, it, as much as you can mitigate risk. It's important, but know that it's always there, and risk can then bring the reward too. Fantastic. Um, in your book, Arthur, you say that having kids is not incompatible with having a career. Uh, you also say that in the '80s, when it came to life's greatest hat trick, love, kids, and career, your peers at senior elect level felt that a woman could only score two out of the three. Um, do you still think that's the case? And if so, or if not, uh, what's changed? 
I think it still really is tough. Like I think anyone trying to juggle any kind of a home life and whether your family is kids, whether your family is taking care of an aged parent or you know, sibling or whatever your situation is, the family that you've built around you, uh, it's never easy to, to be able to do everything at once. And so I always like to say, it's, can you have it all? Yes, you can have it all, but you have to decide what it is. And you have to make some choices, and you have to make choices alongside that family that's around you, around what your priorities are. And I do feel for the women who went before us. Like there were, uh, you know, I'm very, I had a, a great female boss when I was first starting out who was of a different generation, the generation before, and it was even tougher for them. Yeah. There weren't things like maternity leave, there weren't in Canada, there weren't those kind of opportunities. So they had to make tough choices about their home life that we are, have the luxury of actually stepping into. Does it make it easy? No, it's still difficult to, to make it all work. But I think we have a lot more support than ever before, and the opportunities are there. And I think the more that we understand that these, these choices around family aren't a woman's issue, but they're a family issue, then I think you see governments and you see policies and businesses stepping up and understanding that if they want a happy workforce and a productive one, they need to support the, them at home as well. And I very proudly, when I was at Twitter, was working for a company that, you know, in the U.S., you don't have maternity leave, there is no legislative maternity leave, but companies step up and, and provide it. Twitter also provided paternity leave. And of the four or five people who took parental leave at the time that I was there, uh, and out of my team, they were all men who took paternity leave. So, I th you know, I think there is an understanding and an awakening, and yet they had the same questions that any woman would have, or we would have had when we went to make those choices. They came to me going, if I take this paternity leave, like, will you consider me for a promotion, or do you think I'm not as dedicated as the... It was interesting. Like, they have the exact same challenges that we have, but they never had necessarily the opportunity to consider that they could put themselves up for that. So, when these things policies change, I think we all have bigger conversations around what it means to have family, what it means to have work, and how do you make the two fit together? Yeah, I think we have come a long way in the last uh, in the last twenty years, and it's one of the things that really resonated me with me with your book was defining it all and having it all, um, because I truly believe that it, it's different for everyone. And um, I was speaking to um, a lady who started her own business and she said to me, you know, I left my corporate career job to go and start my own company and for me my goal was enough to make enough to hire a cleaner. And she said the rest of the time I spent with my family and I was feeling fulfilled and great and for her that's her version of success and yeah. that was her having it all and I just think it's... Um, and I think it's, it's really important for all of us to make room for everybody's yeah. version of what it is for them. And Absolutely. I think sometimes we judge others, and women can be our own harshest critics with other women sometimes. And I think it's all about support. It's all about understanding that people have, you have to step in the shoes of others to understand what they're going through, as, as that old saying is. But you have to give people the grace to live their life the best way that they can. And their choices might not be your choices, but you have to believe that if they're within your circle, that there are people who are trustworthy and are trying to do the best they can. And I think we just have to support each other in doing the best we can. And since I started this venture, I have to say that I have been overwhelmed in a really, really good way um, at the amount of support women do have for each other. And uh, my background wasn't in diversity and inclusion or women in leadership. And coming into this, I thought, oh, there might still be that tall poppy kind of syndrome where um, you don't want to help each other in. And actually, I, I have found the opposite. Um, it's just great. everybody wanting to help each other, boost each other up, and support each other, which has just been... It's so important. It doesn't always happen, but it's so important that we remember that we can't judge others by the same decisions we yeah. make for ourselves. So. Fantastic. Um, so the concept of work-life flow is only one chapter in your book. Uh, can you tell us more about how the pace of change in business is creating opportunities for women to step up as leaders? Um, so why is it our turn to lead? Well, I, I talk a bit about it in the book, and there's, you know, there's forces out there that are really changing the way business works and the way business defines success. And the fast-paced environment that we live in now, live in now, the fact that there's so much data um, exchanging hands, the fact that uh, people have got the power in their hands because of technology, whether it's a smartphone or whether it's just other versions of technology that bring power to them as individuals and have a voice. It means that the you know the balance has shifted, and you can't run these monolithic businesses with a boss in a corner office making decisions from on high. 
you really do, if you're going to run a successful business, it's a matter of not just taking advantage of those voices, but really learning from those voices and understanding how to serve customers better, how to serve clients. You know, in whatever business you are, there is data out there and information that like never before mm -hmm. that you can tap into. Why would you ignore that and try to you know, dictate from a, a position of, of power as you think you have or authority? how you think sh things should go because you're missing out the opportunity of a whole bunch of people telling you how it is going. Right. And so that requires leadership at different levels. And I think some when we talked before about career path and getting upset if you are not the CEO by the time you're 30, there are actually, I think, opportunities to lead at different levels than ever before. You actually have authority and good companies do this. Not all are doing it, but good companies and ones that are successful understand that you need to you need to push that decision making, authority, like all of those pieces of, that, are, that indicate leadership need to be pushed down throughout a company if you're going to manage that influx of information that's coming by so quickly. So it's that you have the ability to analyze and ingest and when you, when, when you can Google an answer today, it's not about having, you know, asking you know, the right, or having the right answer, it's actually asking the right question. Like you need, right. you, the power has shifted and you need uh, different people at different levels leading and so I think you know whether it's the recognition that you can have people at the top that don't necessarily look like the ones that did in the past um, whether it's a guy in a hoodie or a woman in stilettos like the world is changing and might not change as quickly as we'd like it to but it is changing and then there is this opportunity at different levels within business or as individuals starting your own businesses to lead in their own way that they never, you never had the capacity for before and you never had the demand for before and it's now necessary for businesses that want to succeed. Wow. Um, can you give us any tips for how to really take advantage of these trends right now, like today, what can we walk away with from this and say, let's put this in, into action tomorrow? Yeah, I think you know, everyone is at their own level and you have to determine what you're trying to get out of where you are. But I had a great uh, experience where I was speaking at a, um, in front of a group of a large group of women, and at the end, a young woman came up to me and said, "That's great, uh, your story, but you're the boss, so you can kind of call the shots and do what you want." But I'm, she, I said, "What's your story?" And she said she was a um, researcher at a largely sales company, and so I said, "How do you spend your day?" She said, "Well, I spend my day." Um, I'm, I, I go into meetings where I'm sitting around a table with a bunch of sales guys who ask me a bunch of questions and I give them the answers. And that's what they need to go, and they go off and, and, and execute on those and make their sales. And so I said, well, it's, so this is the point where I say, think about what you're doing and how you can actually turn it into a leadership moment. And I said to her, well, you must notice when you're going through your research, certain trends or things that are happening, like as opposed to being the person sitting at the table answering a bunch of questions, maybe there's an opportunity here for you to speak to the person who's setting up the meeting and say, hey, I've noticed this trend, and I'd love to talk to the guys around the table about what I'm seeing here because maybe it will tell them something that they're not thinking of when I'm just listening, when I'm just being a repository of answering questions. You know, yeah. like maybe they'll think a bit broader because I've seen this trend. Like maybe this is helpful. Uh, I said try that because ultimately it shifts the conversation to not being one where you're just functioning as a as a person in a role, but you're actually you know, thinking strategically and, and, and imparting knowledge and leadership uh, on that team. And so I think there's times like that where I think each of us can can think about stepping up a bit differently and sharing. I, I talk about in the book about how I'm not a naturally gregarious kind of person and leadership is often related to you know people who have that kind of you know great personality mm -hmm. that can stand in front of a room and lead it and get them all excited. I think uh, sometimes the, the, the shyness, though, can be uh, a bit of selfishness. Like ultimately, when you don't speak up at the table, and I'm not talking about lean in, because I think lean in was a good reminder that it's a call to action that we do need to speak up. But this, I think a lot of people, myself included, got, well, how do I speak up? Because they're just gonna speak over me, or they're just gonna, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes it's that recognition that you have to get over yourself. That the idea that I'm not gonna say anything at the table because, well, you're not really fully doing your job, are you? Like someone believes in you to put you in that job. Someone has trusted in you and given you the, you know, the ability, the rights, the authority, whatever, to do that job. If you don't speak up, that great idea that you had in the shower all by yourself might not be the great idea that it could be unless you bring it to the table and everybody can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that kind of shyness or that inhibitedness is, is, I think, the only way I could get over it myself is to say that was selfish and I'm not doing my job. If someone believes in me, I'm not fully doing my job if I don't speak up. So I think it's 
sometimes it's the kind of practical things you can do to just kind of turn a t turn a corner around how your relationship to work is or to your peers or to your boss and and that gets hopefully recognized and you put some wins under your belt and 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 you, you can start to start to build a future fantastic sometimes i think in those situations is i always sort of say well what's the worst case scenario if i bring this idea up and they hate it so what yeah 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 uh, they'll move on to the next one in two seconds and forget about it exactly that i had to so, do the same thing I, yeah. I was like you know what i you you because you think again you have those shower moments where you're like why did i say that that was so yeah. stupid but you're like you're the only one thinking that right now everyone else is gone off because no one else cares yeah, 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 the only one obsessing so, about this right now yeah. so get over it yeah oh fantastic okay um, so, do you think the concept of talent, connecting professional women with flexible work, is going to succeed? So, has the pace of change caught up with what we're demanding for flexible work, or do we, are we still well ahead of the curve in our expectation of engaged workplaces and flexible policies? So, that's a, a very weighted question. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, no, I think, I, you know, and I think that is a valid question, the question of whether businesses uh, can move fast enough and accommodate for this the speed of change that we need to in order to to create good business in order to create you know sol solid business leaders within it and you know the the opportunity to create a space where uh, you can you can provide uh, different experiences for women as they come and you know, why not tap into the experience and knowledge and talent of a bunch of women who maybe because of their circumstances don't want to commit to a full-time career at this moment like maybe in their world that's not fitting into their their daily lives but they have so much to contribute and i took a moment when i left twitter to think to myself because i was getting lots of bits and pieces of really cool opportunities in, and i had some some pretty major conversations about definite jobs as well but there were also these opportunities where i thought well maybe i can kind of just put things together and actually make a different life for myself where I'm not part of a larger organization or part of a system. Um, Dibley came along and it was pretty incredibly exciting so I went that way, but there, there is something about um, the opportunity to not only as a, as a person experience uh, different businesses and, and different ways of working, but those businesses benefit from it mm -hmm. because you're bringing that different perspective. And they were all talking to me, wanting to use my brain for different pieces of it. And so I think, you know, when you think about a, a, a person and what you can give and contribute, I think it's, it's interesting that as individuals, as women, if we've decided that we need to manage our lives in a certain way that we can't commit to full-time work, it doesn't mean we can't still contribute. So I think the question is, are businesses ready to accept that? I think clever businesses will be. And you see them making that move. You see them understanding and you've seen the difference in the states where um, they, are suddenly grappling these companies where, who give these maternity leaves that didn't give them in the past, they're just suddenly trying to figure out, well, wait a minute, how am I gonna replace this person or who's gonna do the work while they're gone? Or like, there, is, there is also that sense too that they need an understanding of transient work or, or flexible work so that they can scale up and scale down when they, when they need to. Yeah, well, that's good news for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have uh, just one question here that has come uh, online, I'll just ask this and then maybe we'll wrap it up and have a, a few questions here. Sure. Um, so when you feel like the role you are in may not be a fit any longer, either with your lifestyle or values, what steps do you take to find the next right opportunity? And I think again, that's different for everybody, but I, I think it does, it, it's not necessarily an aha moment. You might make the decision to leave after an aha moment, but I think you get niggly reminders or prodding that it's that what you're doing isn't necessarily where you are doesn't necessarily suit you or your skill set anymore you see decisions being made uh, that the company is moving in a certain direction that you don't necessarily agree with or you're finding that as an industry the business that you're in is somehow not keeping up or is is, is, is somehow kind of being sidelined you know I think you need to consistently keep your head up to notice what's going on around you and how you're fitting within it to then finally have your aha moment, and that's when we talked about planning, that's when we talked about, then you have those conversations. If you're in a position where you can't have the luxury of quitting and then deciding what to go do next, which, as I said, was scary for me too, and I had to make sure that I saved up to do it, I understand that not everybody can, then it is a matter of, of investing time in yourself, because ultimately it is a, a large investment for you, 
uh, in you uh, to to figure out what else is going on out there that matches your interests and your and your and your value. Because and I think that value part is important. I mean, we underestimate it sometimes. We think about our skill set and what we can contribute. The the value set is really important too. Is this a company that I feel like I can belong to? Because ultimately, as I just heard a stat today, the the number one reason for leaving a company isn't the paycheck. It is I feel like I belong. Yeah. Uh, and and if you're no longer feeling like you belong, that doesn't come all of a sudden. It tends to come over time. And I think that's when you start putting your head up, talking to people who you do feel, talking to your, your network, but talking to a number of people. I have people always ask me, do you, do you believe in mentors? And I do, but I actually believe in a cabinet of mentors. I believe in keeping a number of people, because no one person can satisfy every need that you have. If you have people spread out through businesses, they can tell you how their businesses are going. And I think that's important to kind of keep that conversation going. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, I think that was it for the questions. We had some really good comments coming through online uh, throughout the conversation, which we can uh, have a look over after. Great. Um, at this point, I'm not sure how much longer we have left for the live broadcast. Does anyone have any questions you want to ask right now, or shall we wrap this up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering um, what you did when you had your children, like when, when you went back to work. You had two kids, was it? Two kids, yeah. 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 So, yeah. What did you do when you went back? Was it full time, and how did you make that work for your? What was your version of it all? Yeah, that was that was a, that was not a necessarily a choice. Like it's interesting because not everybody you know gets electric planning or whatever. I did plan having my first um, daughter, but what I didn't plan was um, it. I was the uh, breadwinner in the family at the time. Then I became the sole breadwinner uh, in the family during the time I was pregnant. So I didn't get the opportunity to take the maternity leave oh. as, as, as you can afford to because again I wasn't at a business that topped up uh, your, your, your uh, unemployment insurance and so as a family we couldn't afford just to, ha to have the sole breadwinner at, out uh, with only just getting um, uh, employment benefits unfortunately so I went back to work after six weeks. Oh I was working um, within a couple of weeks from home and then at going physically back to work after six weeks. Where were you at the time? I was in Toronto in a, in a distribution company. Wow. And they just didn't, it wasn't a big enough company. The media companies aren't necessarily that good with providing extra benefits like that. So that's where I, where I found myself. And you know, in the end you make it work because you have to. Um, but that's when I say about not judging others. Like the story of me only taking six weeks maternity leave is one that is lives beyond me. Yeah. The context of why I did it doesn't, and yet it's so. Sometimes I I I notice I get I, I get portrayed as someone who's incredibly ambitious. So you only took six weeks off of your yeah. And so it's in, so that's when I say about not judging others. I think we all have to kind of make even if everything works exactly to plan. I remember when Marissa Meyer um, was having her first baby and she was you know, that much pregnant when they hired her to be CEO of Yahoo. And, you know, there was a lot of question like, honey, you don't know what you're doing and, you know, you, you're going to find yourself in a real pickle. Ultimately, hopefully she figured it out before she even accepted that position and, the, and she would have talked to the board about what she was doing to, to make, make sure that that did work. But it's a decision that a person makes with their family. It's not a decision for all of us to judge. And so I think you just make, you end up making it work. Um, people depend on communities around them parents, kids, you know, it's, it's, it's all about how you make it work is all going to be your own judgment, but we did everything from daycare to, um, you know, to nannies to like the whole raising kids is, is again, it's, a, it's always a bit of a flex situation and you just do the best you can. So, um, I have another question that's come up through the, uh, <coughs> through Facebook. Um, it says, uh, could you tell us what you do when everything work life, kids, family, the whole gong show feels like it's too much. So how do you prioritize and adjust um, to feel more balanced and less stressed? Yeah, and that's hard, right? Because sometimes it all does happen at once. Like there is, I, that's why I talk about the work-life flow and this idea of balance is such a um, artificial sense of mm -hmm. you can do one and then do the other and it will all work out. I tell the story sometimes, which just proves me to be a bad mother, that <laughs> I, I was, uh, supposed to be participating in a big uh, meeting. Uh, I was actually chairing a meeting, I believe, and my eldest got sick. She was about probably five or six years old at the time. Could, I think I either, got, well, I either couldn't go to work or I got called from work. I can't remember exactly what the situation was, but I was home with her and this call was coming up. And I remember being on the phone and holding back her hair <laughs> as she was being ill. And 
you know, talk about doing what you need to do. Like, and that's an incredibly stressful moment. You feel like a horrible mother at the time. You feel like you're not giving everything to hear. I think you have to, um, the only thing you can do is, I can't say you go off to a spa day or, because those things never really give you a long lasting sense of, of, of relief. You just have to be, you have to be sure in yourself that you're doing the best you can. You have to give yourself a break. Yeah. And whether that break is taking a moment to yourself and doing things that you, that are outside of your work or home life that keep you satisfied because it's, it's, it's another interest that you have. Whatever it does, whatever you can fit into your life that makes sense, I think the ultimate thing you have to do, the first thing you have to do is be okay with your choices. Because if you're so not okay with your choices, then something is wrong with your choice, and it doesn't, it's not really your choice then. Yeah. And so what, what, do you, what do you do to make sure that, you, that those things align? Because you've got to give yourself a break internally and just say, that's what I have to do today. You know, like, and, that's, and, and, and she's fine. She's, uh, the benefit of all this is that she's now 20. <laughs> <laughs> I have a 16 year old, and they're great. <laughs> and I'm very lucky, knock on wood, but you know, I think sometimes that gives a lot of people relief too when they hear when they're at baby stage or your little kid stage, that it does work out. You make it work. Like you, you, you it, it is in the end human nature, and we all are trying to do the best we can. Which I think is great to hear, because when you're in the thick of it, with the little kids and the late nights and the everything else, you feel like sometimes you can't see the end of it. You can't see the end of it. Yeah. So it is yeah. nice. Yeah. nice to hear. I went through that too. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, should we take any more questions from here, or maybe uh, we'll wrap it up and, and say thank you very thank much you. for taking great. the time to chat with us, and, uh, and yeah. Well, well congratulations on talent, I think. Ladies, check it out. Gentlemen, check it out. I think it's, I think it's a matter of figuring out how, again, how you fit that. There is no such thing as balance, so creating an opportunity in a new world where there is no such thing as balance, but there's a whole lot of flex going on, I think. What you're building is a, is a really credible opportunity for people. So Thanks. get involved. Thanks. But the thing, the thing for me that I really want to do is just inspire women to inspire and to, to say, yeah, it might be hard, it might be a bit messy, but you know, I think I truly believe that we can, we can do both. And uh, so that's it. Great. Great. Okay. Thanks Thank very you. much.